What is up, guys? Welcome back to another amazing episode of the Bleeding BNG Podcast, episode 60. So I guess we're going to call this our what? Our Chris Samuels episode? But we have another fire episode for you guys today. I'm going to try to wrap this up quickly um, because today's episode, I'm just going to be talking about my training camp experience. We're going to title this episode, Coming to You Live from Training Camp. Um, this is going to be in the in the, in the the realm that we did our, you know, Coming to You Live from OTA episode, which has ended up being our most popular episode on YouTube and I think our most popular episode on all podcast platforms. So that was one of the um, staple episodes that put us on the map, and I'm going to just give you guys the same feel here. Um, With that being said, today is Tuesday, August the 2nd. It's about 8 p.m., and on Friday, July 29th, and today, I actually had the chance to go um, watch um, the Washington Commanders practice over in Ashburn at, you know, the Washington Commanders' new facility. I'm not sure what they're calling it. It used to be called Redskin Park. But I'm going to just call it over there on Coach Gibbs Drive over there in Ashburn. Um, So before I get into the football aspect of it, I'm going to go ahead and shout out the Washington Commanders for the hospitality. I know a lot of people have been complaining about the lottery process and things like that. Um, But you guys have made it rather rather easy for season ticket holders. And no, uh, I'm not trying to be like, oh, I'm a season ticket holder. I should be uh, get preferential treatment or anything like that. I'm just pointing out that, you know, the season ticket holders haven't had that, you know, difficulty um, in the lottery system. You know, you kind of get what you pay for sometimes. Um, So, you know, I've had the opportunity to go to multiple practices. We've had our boots on the ground uh, providing live updates. So if you haven't followed us yet, be sure that you're checking in our social media pages. I'm going to tag those at the end of the video. And if you're checking us out on YouTube, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Like I told you guys, we've had a boom since that OTA episode, and I'm loving the interactions, and I'm loving all the people that's been coming over to check out the Bleeding BNG episodes. Um, and just see what we're talking about over here when we chat over, over over um, talking about some Washington Commander football. Um, because like I said, I really think that, you know, I got some some gems to give to share with you guys so i appreciate everybody supporting um but like i said shout out to the commanders um shout out to the players actually shout out to the players um like i said training camp was a a wonderful experience um i'll be the first to say i was kind of bummed when it wasn't in richmond um last year was my second time in Richmond, um, I think it was, but it was my first time like spending the night up there, spending a couple of days up there. Um, you know, being up as in Richmond as a you know an adult, I think my first time there was in 2012. I was a senior in high school, so I went with family and things like that. But I love the Richmond vibe. You know, I love the vibe. You know, feeling like you get getting away. And, you know, um, even with, like, in the team aspect, building team camaraderie, you're not coming home. You're going to dorm rooms and things like that. You're spending the night with your team. But that's completely different this year. And it's not just with the commanders. It's with um, most teams in the NFL. I think everybody's having their training camp near their facility, if not at their facility. Um, but shout out to the players um, because in this more intimate setting where they're not, where there isn't as many fans, um, they have been sure to, to give the to to show the fans love, to show the fans their admiration, and show the fans their appreciation. Um, I've been out there with my brother, and he's had uh, my younger brother, and he's had a hell of a time. Um, he has pictures with Jonathan Allen, Carson Wentz, um, and I'm really glad that I'm able to give him that experience. Um, and then on Friday, I was actually able to get an autographed jersey from the man himself. If you guys can't see us, if you're checking this out on YouTube, you can see that's that autographed Terry McLaurin jersey. I'm waiting for the jersey frame now because, you know, that's going back um, to complete the aesthetics for sure, to pop off the aesthetics for sure. I'm getting my jersey frames and my fat head. We getting right for football season. But as you guys can see, I had that autographed Terry McLaurin jersey. But, I mean... He wasn't the only one showing love. Almost every player um, took their time out. Uh, but shout out to like Terry McLaurin and Jonathan Allen, the two superstars on the team. Um, on Friday, they spent about 90 minutes out there um, after practice. I, they, practice ended at 11. They were out there until about 12.30. Um, just signing things for fans and things like that. Um, so shout out to the commanders for the hospitality. and I'm looking forward to a great football season. Now it's time to get into the nitty gritty. Let's get on to what I've seen on the field. So I'm going to just wrap up what I've seen over the course of um, the two sessions that I've been at. I'm not going to, you know, isolate any particular session, but some notes that I saw consistent with the two sessions. Um, If I feel the need to isolate, um, you know, oh, this happened on Friday or this happened today, I will. Um, But I just have some notes that, you know, um, I've seen trend throughout training camp. So the first thing that I noted down is the defense has been dominant. 
Both days that I've been there, the defense is um, won the day. Um, if you had to declare a winner of the day, um, they've been out there flying around. Um, all all the units, um, the D-line, the linebacker core, and the secondary. Um, and, you know, I'm hesitant. I'm hesitant to give them their praise because, you know, this time last year, I was hyping up this defense to be the best defense in the NFL. You know, they were coming off the 2020 season where they ranked second in the NFL, granted um, facing a lot of, you know, bad quarterbacks and poor quarterback play and things like that. But at this time last season, you can't get me to say a bad thing about this defense. And then they, ha- they ended up having me look, look foolish. Um, because they, um, if I'm being honest, they were doing the same thing in camp to Ryan Fitzpatrick last year, and these were kind of some of the reasons why you know I didn't, um, you know I wasn't I wasn't you know too concerned coming out of camp. Um, because if you guys can remember, um, I was mentioning that you know Ryan Fitzpatrick and Taylor Heineke were both having their struggles in Richmond last year, but you know I chalked it up to you know they were going against this dominant defense and things like that. That isn't the case this year. I'm not giving them go- them guys the benefit of the doubt. Um, but this year, um, they're, they're stepping up, um, and it's been consistent throughout the uh, throughout the two sessions that I've been at. Um, the thing that I me- I want to mention is that the 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 best session that I've seen is the first session that the offense had, and that was the nine on nine session on. Um, Friday, um, the ball barely touched the ground. Um, that's the best session that I've seen Carson Wentz have. But even with um, all the quarterbacks, um, I don't think Cole Kelly got m- many reps. But I think the ball only touched the ground on the last rep of the session. And they ran about 15 to 20 plays um, during that series um, amongst, you know, the three quarterbacks and things like that. And I think the only um, the only incompletion was Taylor Heineke. Um, and I, I don't even think it was his fault. I think it was on a, che- a drop check down and things like that. So the first session that I saw, the first offense team-like setting, um, it was still 9 on 9 so it wasn't full 11 on 11 football. And it gives the offense some advantages because you're not facing as much pressure as you would in a real game um, situation and things like that. The offense came out firing, and this is after you know um, it was made a lot to be on social media throughout the beat, uh, throughout you know the beat reporters and the uh, media team and things like that. That you know on Thursday the defense came out firing, so um, you know the offense was loud. The offense was loud. Terry came over um, in that nine on nine session. They were torching the defense. Terry came over. I vividly remember he was right in my face, running over to Chris Harris, telling them like, "You gonna hear from us today? Like y'all might have got us yesterday, but you gonna hear from us today." Um, so I, I definitely remember that. Um, and I also remember um, just the secondary um, communicating um, in, in the 909 sessions. Um, and it got better over over time throughout um, Friday and today. But like I said, the ball didn't touch the ground. So I'm like, all right, Carson's putting on the show. You know, a lot has been made out of uh, the fans not being there or anything. But in my two sessions there, there's been a, a lot of fans there um, for, you know, as many fans that can be on the, you know, Ashburn setting, on Coach's, Coach Gibbs Drive and things like that. Um, but the, 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 the speed is evident. The speed is evident on offense. Um, Curtis Samuel was very limited. I think he ran about two routes in that 909 session. And Antonio Gibson didn't practice on Friday. So you're missing two of your more explosive players, but the speed was still evident. You still have Terry flying around. You still have Jahan Dotson flying around. You still have the army out there. And Cole Turner, um, I'm gonna touch more on Cole Turner later. So I don't wanna, I don't wanna bury the lead just yet, but you still have him out there. And, um, so you still have a lot of, um, pass catchers capable. And it was evident um, in that nine on nine session, but but um, right, it was almost as if right after I tweeted after that nine session that Carson was in his bag today. That all went downhill. That all went downhill um, when they went to eleven on eleven, and then big boys. And keep in mind, on Friday they weren't in pads, so today um, was actually their first day of training camp in pads. So we got to see him smack heads a little bit, um, you know, knock each other around and things like that. But on Friday. Even without pads, when those big boys, when Jonathan Allen and Deron Payne were inserted into that 11-on-11 team session, Carson, it looked like Carson Wentz didn't know what to do out there. He was every ball that he throws is uh, every ball that he threw on that day was high, and it kind of I, I, I'm not going to say it's concerning, but it kind of is puzzling to me um, that somebody that's so big he's huge, especially in person. He's every bit of six five, and it's it's kind of puzzling that when he misses, he misses high. He was throwing balls to Terry McLaurin. It looked like he was throwing them to Shaquille O'Neal and Yao Ming. 
And then even receivers shorter than, than Terry McLaurin, like like some of the undrafted free agents. Deami Brown ran one of the best routes I've seen him run in his 18 months here. He ran a post corner. Uh, I think it was on Jamin Davis, and then Carson just completely missed him. Um, and the ball sailed over his head onto the sideline. Um, so, and I will say, I will say, I'm not going to put all of this on Carson because the offensive line, a thing that I've seen throughout the last two days, with pads off on Friday and with pads on today, they have been getting their asses handed to them. They have been getting their asses handed to them, no matter if it's the first team, the second team, the third team, you name it. And, and I'll be naive to not think that that is contributing to some of the poor quarterback play that we've seen throughout training camp. Because it's been well documented about the poor quarterback play, but I haven't seen the poor offensive line play as documented. Um, today wasn't Andrew Norwell's finest moment at all. Uh, um, Deron Payne beat him on a couple of plays. You know, Trey Turner hasn't really practiced since day one. We don't know what's going on with him. I saw him on the side field and it didn't look like he was exerting too much energy today. Um, he might just be, you know, you know, getting that veteran coast through the training camp. That's what it looked like to me. But I don't want to put that on a player. But I'll be naive to not tell you what I think over here at Bleeding BNG. You know, we give you the most raw, unfiltered, and uncut um, commentary on the Washington Commanders. You know, he was over there on the sideline, um, on the side field with Chase Young and Logan Thomas and things like that. And those guys are coming off two ACLs. And to me, it seemed like those guys were exerting more energy than him. So I, 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 I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, but I will say, um, I'm more concerned about the guard position, both right and left guard. Um, exiting training camp today than I was going into training camp on Friday. You know, I think a lot of us, you know, chalked up, oh, Andrew Norwell, Trey Turner, you know, they have experience in the wrong system, and they were dominant in the wrong system. I think both guys uh, made all pros or pro bowls uh, under um, Ron Rivera and, you know, um, John Mascow, um, playing with the Carolina Panthers and things like that. So, you know, and I, I might have been guilty of it too, you know, just chalking it up to them, but this isn't 2015 anymore. This isn't 2016. Um, Andrew Norwell was a free agent for a reason. Um, his play fell off since he signed that big deal in Jacksonville. Uh, Trey Turner was horrible last year. He was a shell of himself last year. And let's hope that he doesn't keep this trajectory because he's going on the trajectory of not being in the league too much longer. And that's a sad case for a guy who was once a what? A four-time straight pro bowler? Um, he, he looked like, like I, like I mentioned on the, um, rambling about Washington or rambling with Rio podcast that last year with the Steelers. And even when he was playing with San Diego the year before that, he didn't look like he had some of his athletic gifts. He looked like he lost, um, some athletically. He was not able to pick a lot of, uh, pick up a lot of, you know, stunts and games like things like that. And, you know, that's something that I didn't necessarily see, you know, going away as you got older. He's only 29. He's only 29, so having these physical limitations start to pop up this early, sort of say, in your career is kind of concerning. Um, but, yeah, I'm concerned about the offensive guard position. Um, Charles Leno has seemed to have been holding it down. Um, Sam Cosby has seemed to be doing okay. Um, but I will say, and, and I will say that nobody in this training camp so far has been able to contain Montez Sweat. And he's letting you hear about it play in and play out, day in and day out. Mark Ted Sweat and Kendall Fuller are the two MVPs of this camp so far. By far. By far. In both sessions that I attended, these two dudes dominated. And like I told you, Montez let you hear about it. He's the loudest guy on the practice field, and I feel like he's got his swagger back. Um, I know Coach Rivera has mentioned at times that he felt like, you know, Montez isn't the most uh, mature and things like that. But I'm honestly thinking that he's using this as a release. We got to think, we got to remember, this guy went through a personal tragedy eight months ago. And he also doesn't, didn't have the year that he wanted to have with the broken jaw and things like that. So he's probably, you know, getting back to the game that he loves. And even, even today, I was like, all right, all right, Taz, you're doing a little too much. Um, because, you know, they were chirping about a pass that uh, Cole Turner um, you know, caught or didn't catch, you know, that's what the debate was about, that he um, leaped over Bobby McCain to catch. And it was like Montez was the only one still talking about the play five minutes later. But you can tell that he's passionate this year. And it's something that I saw in camp last year. And my only concern is I just hope that he's not a camp standout because I, I want him to play with that same passion on Sundays. And I think that, you know, some of it um, is that, you know, he, he, he was complacent. With you know, not 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 being the Robin to Chase Young, but having 
but, but being, being outside of the spotlight, I don't think that Tez, Tez is very shy. I think that he's a guy that doesn't like the, the media attention. So he, he allowed Chase to have that. And, you know, he allowed the, uh, himself to, you know, seep in the shadows and things like that. But I, I think that this is the year he sees that everybody's getting paid on that defensive line. He knows that it's his time. This is his year, technically, to get paid. Uh, we did extend them, but you know the fourth year of that you know rookie contract is really when you know you guys look to get the big bucks and things like that. So I see it. Montez Sweat has probably been the best player in camp so far. Nobody has been able to block him in individuals and, and team drills and, and like I, three. I, I tweeted it three years in, and it's still unreal to see his speed coming off the edge. When you see that four four one, what did he run in the combat? At four four two, four four one speed at six six, two hundred and sixty pounds. Like that's freakish. That's freakish athleticism, and it pops playing and play out on the practice field. I just need him to translate it to Sunday because he has all the makings to be the best pass rusher in the game. He's even freakier than our second, uh, our second overall generational pick, Chase Young, who is a freak in his own right. Don't get me wrong; I'm not saying that Chase Young is nothing to scoff at by any means. But Montez Sweat is, is is has stuff that one percent of men in the in the entire world have. Like he's that level type athlete, and I just need him to translate it to Saturday, um, or to Sundays because he's showing it on the practice field. He's whipping ass. He's whipping ass. And as I mentioned before, Kendall Fuller is having himself a camp. And you guys know how harsh we've been on Kendall Fuller. I love Kendall Fuller. I love Kendall Fuller's game. Like I've told you guys before, he has some of the best IQ and some of the best football intellect that I've I've seen out of any player in history. Kendall Fuller's football IQ has allowed him to what to, to, to do some of the things that he does with the physical limitations that he had. But guess what? I think that those those physical limitations were even, you know, turned up a lot last, last year because I don't think that he was healthy. There's no way you can tell me Kendall was healthy with some of the pop that I'm seeing with him this year. I've seen plays where he, uh, multiple occasions, multiple occasions. Now, don't be alarmed when I say this because Terry has had his, few share, his fair share of wins as well. But I've, there's there's been multiple occasions where Kendall is just like Terry McLaurin down running with him stride to stride. And you don't think of that with Kendall Fuller. You don't think of him as a burner. And guess what? Terry still got that juice. It's not like he's losing a step. So I think that Kendall Fuller is finally healthy. I think that that knee issue that he's had over the course of his career caught up to him last year. And it wasn't um, a lot uh, made to be out of it and, you know, the, the media and things like that. But you can tell. Like, there's no way that you can tell me the Kendall Fuller that I'm seeing this year and the Kendall Fuller last year. He was getting cooked in training camp last year by De'Ami Brown. Now he translated to this year, he's locking up Curry McCormick. That's not the same player. You can't tell me that he was healthy. But it's glad I'm, I'm glad to see it. I'm glad to see it. Um, one thing that I mentioned um, from um, Friday is that Jamin Davis, while he does look good in space, he still is pretty slow on his run fits. He still is pretty slow on his run fits. And today, he was running with the second team on defense. And I can't help but notice that at the the team session didn't start until um, the, the, the wide receivers and the DBs, they were doing one-on-one sessions. And then, like, the offensive linemen, the fronts, um, they were doing run fits, you know, you know, run plays and, you know, um, they had on pass today. So, you know, they were hitting. They were hitting. And they did that before teams. And Jamin, to me, was still slowing his run fits in that drill. And I'm not sure if they were upset with him in that drill coming out so he didn't start out the team session. Because once he came in, he did stay in. But he started out with the twos. He was not one of the first 11 defenders out in the team session today. So that's something to look for. Um, it seems that his progress and his learning development is very slow. Um, and I know a lot has been made out that he's improving or he's been talking about how much he's more comfortable that he seems to be this year. Well, I'm waiting to see. I'm waiting to see. it. I told you guys last year that he has bad eyes. And that's something that that is very difficult to have at the linebacker position in the NFL. With those delayed instincts and things like that, you can be the best physical, the biggest physical freak in the NFL. When you don't know where the ball is going, you're not going to make the play. But he's still a physical specimen. Like I said, he has looked good in um, pass coverage and things like that. In the 7 on 7, the 9 on 9s, when they are throwing the ball and things like that, he's there. He's there. He's, he's acted as pretty much an eraser in the middle of the field. But you have to add more to your game. You have to have add more to your game, especially as a linebacker in the NFL. You got to be able to stop the run as a linebacker in the NFL. 
or they're going to be picking on you like they did early in the season last year. A couple of th- more things that I wanted to touch on before I got out of it. Guys, and I, 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 I promise you I'm not trying to start controversy. I promise you I'm not trying to start controversy. And it's crazy because when you look at him side by side, he may honestly be the smallest quarterback on the roster with Taylor Heineke included. Sam Howell might have the strongest arm on this roster. That boy has some juice, has some pop, has some snap, crockling pop, whatever you want to call it with that arm. Oh, he got that rifle. Oh, he got that rifle. And you know, the Madden Top 10 ratings came out and he had the 10th highest arm strength rating in the entire league. Oh, Madden wasn't lying. Oh, it's evident in person. Trust me. It's evident in person. And the releases quick and things like that. Sam balled out on Friday. Now, he struggled a little bit today. It's all the offense did um, in the team session. The team session today was horrible. And I just think that's because the defensive line was whipping ass. I'm not even going to put that on the quarterbacks. The defensive line was in the backfield every play. And this is something that you hear from the defensive line over and over again. Year in and year out, you hear about, you've heard it with Jay Gruden, you've heard it with Ron Rivera, how they get frustrated that you can't run offensive plays. Well, defensive line, I need to see it in the regular season. I'm t- We've been talking about this for about four years now. you got to break the trend at some point. That's why I'm hesitant to give you guys your flowers, because guess what? From what I've seen so far, you deserve it. You guys have been balling out crazy without Chase Young. Without Chase Young. And I can't wait to see preseason because guess what? That's where it starts. That's where it starts. But going back to Sam Howell, man, that boy got that howlister on his on his on his on that right arm, boy. In the nine on nine session, just as Carson Wentz didn't have an incomplete pass or a ball put on the ground, neither did Sam Howell. And then in the eleven on eleven session, um, he continued his success. He had the best 11-on-11 session on Friday. Now, granted, I know he was going against the twos and threes where Carson was going against the ones and Taylor was going against the twos. But I wasn't the only one that that, that, that saw it. Terry McLaurin even walked out. Terry McLaurin was very vocal on Friday now that I think about it. He walked out on the field um, during that 11-on-11 session and very, very loud for everybody to hear told Sam, I like what you've been doing today. I like what you've been doing today. And I did too, Terry. I did, too. It was a beautiful thing to see. No, I'm not starting any uh, quarterback controversies or things like that. I'm just saying, if you let this boy develop properly, we may have a gem on our hands. We may have a gem on our hands. If he can sit back and bask, you know, and bake behind Carson, hopefully in a successful season, maybe you have a quarterback controversy going into the next season or the season after that. Because the talent is there. And I still stand by if Sam Howe was 6'3 or taller, he would have still been a first-round pick in the NFL draft this past season. So for us to get him in the fifth round, these two training camp sessions that I saw just confirmed that we, we got the steal of the draft. We got the steal of the draft. Um, There's not much more that I really need to touch on. Curtis Samuel was on the side field today. He was very limited on Friday. And I hate to talk about it, um, Curtis, in a negative way by any means because – he probably has the most personality on the team. He was out there signing autographs just with Jonathan Allen and um, Terry McLaurin. Like, he was a superstar on the team as well. But I didn't mind it because he, um, like he has conversations with the fans and things like that. He probably has the most personality on the team. But something's got to give at this point, man. Something's got to give at this point, you know. What, five games, six catches last year? You can't practice three straight days this year? Is the number 10 jersey in Washington cursed? Is it really cursed since RG3? Paul Richardson, Paul Richardson, 17 games in what, three seasons? Now you got Curtis, five, six, six games in one season. Now he can't make it through a training camp week of practice without tighten, um, tightening up. I, I'm, I'm not sure what to say. And like I said, it hurts to be negative about him because he's such a good guy. But Terry McLaurin's out there doing Terry McLaurin things. Cooking everybody except Kendall Fuller. They've had their fair share of battles, but he's gotten Kendall a couple of times. I've noticed that he's taking a step to be um, to be more of a vocal leader and things like that. Um, that's something that I noticed. I don't know if he, um, you know, put a keen effort to that and a focus on that. Uh, was that something that's just happened organic and naturally? Was that something that I noticed? Uh, but the speed is there. The pop is there. Um, he's such a he's such a uh, amazing person. 
Uh, he takes his time out with all the fans and things like that. So uh, I, I wouldn't mind Terry McLaurin being the face of this franchise for a long time, um, for sure. Uh, oh, like I said, I didn't want to bury the lead. I'm going to say this now. Logan Thomas, I heard that you listen to the Bleeding BNG podcast. And if you're checking out this episode, my guy, you need to do whatever it takes. I don't know if you need to take a shot. You need to get some more white blood cells. I don't know. You need to do whatever it takes to get back on the field, my guy, because Cole Turner is on a mission. And speaking of Logan Thomas, John Bates included, because John Bates hasn't been in the in the two training camp sessions that I've been have been to as well. He's been off on the side field with like a leg sleeve on. And Cole Turner is making the most out of his opportunities. And guess what? He's building that rapport with Carson Wentz. He's dynamic in the past game. He mauls Bobby McCain today. That play I was talking about, Montez was chirping about. He, he jumped up. Bobby McCain's hit, forehead was at his belly button. Like it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't a, a contest. That's coming off two touchdowns that he had in the day prior on um, Monday. And he's every bit of six, 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 seven. And he's more fluid as a route winner than I saw on tape in Nevada. So you can tell that he's a worker. He's a worker. Carson has been finding him on the check down as well. That's not something that he really did at Nevada. But his run after the catch has been uh, better than advertised, in my opinion, based off you know watching the film and things like that. But, hey, I know he's a rookie. But Cole Turner is pushing for that tight end number one, bro. And I'm liking all the tight ends. Curtis Hodges has made some plays as well. Sam East wasn't out there on Friday, but today he was making some plays. Sam East is a tenacious run blocker. Sam East is a tenacious run blocker, and that might be what keeps him on this team because I think everybody else in the tight end room is a more gifted pass catcher. And I think they might be taller or just as big as Sam East. No, some of them are taller. I know Curtis Hodges is about 6'8". Eight, But yeah, man, that's my training camp wrap up. Um, the speed is evident. Um, the, the communication in the secondary. Uh, let me touch base on the secondary really quickly. I'm really liking what I'm seeing from the secondary. Uh, but I'm gonna hold. I'm gonna hold my uh, my skeptics out until the regular season because you know that's that's the unit that got torched early in the regular season. But you know, the five DBs that are out, that have been out there, they've been running two linebacker sets. Um, it's Cam Curl. Um, uh, who else? Bobby McCain, Kendall Fuller, um, William Jackson. And on Friday, Derek Forrest was actually the fifth DB out there with Cam Curl in the Buffalo Nickel Row. And today in the team session, um, they had Benjamin St. Juice in playing in like the, I don't know if, if when he's in, I don't know if that's the more traditional nickel or he's playing that Buffalo Nickel Row. Uh, but today they were like um, alternating. So you can see um, they're still trying to see who best fits that role. But it looks like that our base front is going to be a two linebacker set. Um, but we see, we'll see who's going to be that fifth defender. You guys know that I'm not the highest on Derek Forrest, but he has made a couple plays. He looked really good in his, in the run fit drill that I was mentioning with Jamin Davis earlier. To, um, in this episode, he looked way better than Jamin did. Um, he was reacting way faster than Jamin did. Um, so I need to see him translated to the games and things like that. But um, Kendall Fuller, like I said, one of the MVPs of camp. William Jackson's looking more comfortable. Um, he did really well in the one-on-ones today. Benjamin St. Juice has gained a lot of weight. You can tell that those concussions kind of scared him off. You can tell that he had to had to start putting some 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 rocks in his back pocket. Start, uh, you know, fending for himself as a big body in the NFL. This is a grown man's league, man. But hey, I'm hoping to get out there for more episodes. Um, for more, I said episodes for more. Um, uh, training camp sessions. I think they go until the third week of August. Um, so I'm hoping to get more invitations. You know, the Washington Commanders have been showing nothing but love. So I think that I'll be able to get out there. I'll have some more fire content, some more fire news for you guys. But in the meantime, check out our social media pages. Our Instagram is at Bleeding BNG. That's B L E E D I N G B N G. Our Twitter is spelled a tad bit different. That's at Bleeding BNG, B-L-E-E-D-I-N-B-N-G. So there's only one G in our Twitter handle. And as I mentioned before, be sure to check us out on YouTube. You can search Bleeding BNG, Bleeding Burgundy and Gold, or my name, Jalen Morgan. 
our episodes are going to pop up. We're about 60 episodes in. The subscribers are rising. And like I said, we're your number one content hub for everything Washington Commanders. We paid to get that, that exclusive access to the season ticket holder so we can give it to you guys so you guys can live through us. Um, so be sure to subscribe. Be sure to tell a friend to tell a friend. Because football season is here, and I'm going to be giving you guys content, news updates, everything. We're coming for everybody's neck in the Washington Commanders community um, this year. And I'm letting you guys know it. And they know it, too. So be sure to check out the next episode of the Bleeding BNG Podcast. I'll check in on you guys later.